In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As Christians, we live in two different worlds. Our commonwealth is in heaven, the Bible tells us, but we are also smack right kadab in the middle of a very real, busy, broken, transitory world. A world that requires things of us, working and paying mortgages and driving the kids to the dentist. We live day-to-day routines that we either choose or sometimes grudgingly accept. And we get pretty good at managing all those little details of our lives. A little of this, a little of that each day. And when you add it all up, and when you stop to think that all this stuff can make a life, it's really hard to take it in. But once a week or so, we gather in this holy place, or one like it, and we are taken for just a little while, sacramentally and mystically, up to heaven. And we worship, and we sing. As mortals, we eat and drink the food of angels. But it's just a glimpse, a foretaste, a fleeting brush with things eternal. I'm sometimes amused by the interesting ways that our two worlds intersect or even collide at odd moments. I've shared with some of you before that sometimes when I'm chanting the gospel at a holy day mass celebrated at night, I glance up from the gospel book and see across the street directly in front of me the person in the barber chair getting his hair cut. And it strikes me as almost funny that Incense and angels and profound truths are only separated from the snipping of hair, the ubiquitous television turned up way too loud, the chatter of polite conversation between barber and patron, only separated by a few feet of asphalt and a quarter inch of glass. The incense rises, the hair falls. Eternity and temporality stare at one another. On Monday, Thursday, a smattering of worshipers gathered over at the altar of repose after a long and emotional liturgy. Can you not watch with me one hour, our Lord asked of us? And we replied, we are trying, Lord, as best we can. The chant from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, was fresh in our hearing and it mingled with the laughter and conversation of departing parishioners in the hallway headed to their cars. On Good Friday, the passion narrative reached its crescendo. Christ said from the cross, it is finished. Jesus bows his head and breathes his last as the thumpa thumpa deep bass of a rap song bounces from a car at a traffic light on Cannon Street. Eternity and temporality seem to be in slightly different keys. As Christians, we believe and teach that God created us for eternity. We also know that we are mortal because we chose disobedience over obedience. And so the psalmist well puts it, The days of our age are but three score and ten, and though some be so strong that they come to four score years, yet it is labor and trouble, and they soon pass away. In the great, incredible, arching timeline of infinity, our little place on it is just the smallest blip of light. As we sing in the old familiar hymn, we blossom and flourish like leaves on a tree, then wither and perish but not changeth thee. And so it was that the God who made us and loved us was not contented to leave us as outcasts from his garden paradise, exiled. Last night in the great vigil of Easter, we heard the whole story of his pursuit of us, the rescue of the righteous Noah and his family from the raging flood, the Passover lamb, the Red Sea, the prophets, the promises. It was all a part of his redemptive purpose. 
in the Eastern Orthodox liturgy for the Easter Vigil, the following hymn is chanted. O life, how canst thou die? How canst thou dwell in a tomb? Yet by thy death thou hast destroyed the reign of death and raised all the dead from hell. Oh, how great the joy, how full the gladness. Wishing to save Adam, thou didst come down to earth. Not finding him on earth, thou didst descend to Hades seeking. The angelic host was filled with awe when it saw thee among the dead. In the tomb, the radiant angel cried, Why do you women mingle myrrh with your tears? Look in the tomb and understand, the Savior has risen from the dead. Eternity stares down temporality. Friends of mine, a husband and wife, just adopted a little baby boy. They have two other adopted girls. All of the children are internationally adopted. The little boy has a birth defect, which is one of the reasons I would imagine that he was put up for adoption. He is not physically perfect, and so he was perhaps unwanted by his birth mother. But my friends not only loved him and traveled to the other side of the world to get him, they gave him his adopted father's name, and it is a name that comes with lots of history. This little boy is the fifth person in direct generations to be called by it. I was profoundly touched this week when I rode by their house and saw a little sign in their yard and all it had on it was the little boy's name followed by the Roman numeral five. You can't get to belong to somebody more than that. A love reached across the globe and claimed a child as its own. Christ emptied himself of heaven and trod all the way to the depths of hell to rescue you and me from its death prison. St. Paul tells us this morning that our old self has died and our new lives are now hid with Christ in God. Imagine that. The essential us, our eternal life, is already tucked away, safe in the heart of God. You can't belong more than that. You can't be loved more than that. Temporality is subsumed in eternity. Death is swallowed up by life. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia.